Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carrie Vitucci, and I serve as the chair of N4A's Virtual Education Committee and will be the moderator for today's webinar. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us for another installment of our summer webinar series. Today's webinar is le led by Stephanie O'Donnell, who is the recipient of the 2021 N4A Research Award. The research award is presented annually to raise awareness for the need for updated research on educating and serving student athletes. As a reminder, if you have questions throughout the course of the live webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I will moderate a short Q&A session at the conclusion of today's webinar. At this time, I'd like to pass things off to Stephanie to kick off today's presentation. Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you. I first want to thank everyone um, for attending this webinar um, and just um, allowing me the opportunity to kind of share some best practices um, on how we can make more inclusive spaces for our um, students and more specifically student athletes with learning disabilities and ADHD. Um, so I'm going to begin by explaining a little bit about why um, I chose the specific topic. So this is my dissertation research. Um, and I specifically chose um, looking at student athletes with learning disabilities and ADHD. Um, this idea stems from a course that I took at Clemson University looking at um, intercollegiate athletes in like psychological aspects. And one of the assignments was to do an annotated bibliography um, specifically picking any type of diagnosis out of the DSM-5. And so I was looking at learning disabilities um, and first looking at intercollegiate athletics and I didn't find much. Um, and so at that point in time, the professor had stated, maybe we should look outward into just students in general with learning disabilities. And I was still struggling to find anything. Um, and so that kind of led me into, well, I know there's a pretty large population of students that we're serving, but there's not a lot of research in what are the ramifications for that? And so that kind of led me down this path of maybe this is an area I should be focusing on. So to kind of just give a quick research overview um, of specific data and research that we have on student athletes with learning disabilities and ADHD, in 1998, N4A was actually one of the first um, organizations or any data I could collect on that published data that said, I believe 2.7 or 2.8 percent of the population of student athletes um, had a learning disability or ADHD. Um, in 1999, there was a disserta dissertation done at Baylor University that focused on Schlossberg's transition theory. Um, and the research done there was just at Baylor University on, uh, I believe it was a qualitative dissertation. In 2002, there was um, a research article that was published in a journal on best practices, um, but that was almost 20 years ago. And at the time that was really good practices, uh, but what does it look like 20 years later in the um, you know, time frame that we're in today? Um, in 2005, kind of in between 1998 and 2005, you're going to find law journals that focus on ADHD um, and ADA and how the NCAA was not looking at remedial courses and following ADA guidelines. And then in 2008, um, we have the NCAA that established educational impacting disabilities as a term. Um, and you can find information on their website about what that means. But that's still kind of limited. Um, in 2013, Dr. Sarah, Sarah Spankowski, who's now at Clemson University, um, she did her dissertation at Tennessee. She's an amazing human, um, and she's really been a trailblazer in this area. Um, she did her dissertation on student athletes with learning disabilities and ADHD. Um, that was a really big uh, I feel like I hit the lottery when I found that dissertation because there was really nothing up until that point. Um, so I really used some of her um, knowledge and guidance uh, through my research. Highly recommend you look at some of the dissertation and work that she's continuously done um, on student athletes if this is an area you're interested in. In um, 2014, she had published some more survey data and when she collected um, that quantitative data, she had asked how many students um, have a disability and that number had increased from the number that had previously been published by N4A. And as you would hope since the passing of ADA, um, more people are comfortable coming forward with uh, disabilities, especially in um, invisible disabilities. In 2015, a professor at UMass Amherst published an article um, in a top tier journal, just looking at kind of students that are um, marginalized or um, kind of under 
underserved. Um, and he specifically, uh, him and his colleagues looked at uh, specific college athletes with learning disabilities and ADHD. Um, in 2016, Wolverton um, had published two articles specifically focusing on, um, it's not backed by actual data, how many potential football players have learning disabilities at big power five schools and the numbers, uh, there was a big discrepancy between what's published there and what those numbers were back in uh, 1998. Um, and then as we get closer to today, um, 2018, lots of concussion research being done, um, but that doesn't really inform academics. And then in 2019, there was a book um, called The Collegiate Athlete at Risk. I actually did a book review on this that was published. Um, highly recommend reading this book. There's some great material in there. Uh, but other than that, it kind of left me with this question of, uh, where do we go from here when we're serving students in an academic capacity? And there's a lot of missing pieces. Um, so the purpose of my study specifically um, was one to add student voice and perspective because um, we're operating in a space where we're serving these students, but we don't have uh, student voice being uh, activated in any way um, or acknowledged. Uh, so approximately only 1% of all scholarly top tier journals between the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and 2014, um, only 1% focused on students in general in higher education, um, not just a specific subcategory. And so the second piece is to provide informed best practices and recommendations so if we are not leading by research um, or best practices in the field that are guided by student voice, then there are legal ramifications uh, or potential legal ramifications for that. Our next is to contribute to the research. So most research has only been conducted at one institution. I really wanted the opportunity to look at what are the commonalities across institutions. Um, and then Lastly, and we'll get more into this, I wanted to take a social justice approach to looking at um, what it means to have a disability. So my main questions for my research was, um, what are the lived experiences of college athletes with a learning disability and or ADHD surrounding disability disclosure, advocacy, and academic support? So those are kind of broken out into question one, two, and three. So question one focuses on the process of self-disclosure, Question two focuses on how do those college athletes actually advocate for their academic success? And question three is how do they describe um, their academic success and how are they getting that support? Um, I do, this is a great time to kind of preference why I, the learning disability and ADHD are two different um, experiences, uh, but I put them together um, so I didn't exclude anyone. So there is a statistic that says about 25 to 50% of people that are diagnosed with one will be diagnosed with the other. Um, and so as I go along, you'll see that there are discrepancies, or I found in my research, there's discrepancies between the experience because with ADHD, students can opt in to take medicine, um, whereas with a learning disability, that's not a thing. Um, and so there, there's discrepancies in their experiences and how it manifests um, in their academics and their social life, uh, but to not exclude anyone, um, I thought I start. I would start with kind of combining the two. Um, so I wanted to talk a quick note about language. So I come from um, taking special education courses and I was always taught to use a person first language, which is you are a student with a disability, you have more, you are more than a disability. Um, and when we talk about the word disability, uh, there are many different um, changes that come along with that terminology based on social, geographical, um, historical context. So in addition to that context, people um, with disabilities have different ways how they might want to be referred to. And so in the United States, we use a person first language, which is a student with a disability. Um, but there is such thing as disability first language of someone standing in that disability. So a disabled student. Um, and so Caller 2012 states that sticking a word in the shadow of a noun can create an impression that there is something inherently wrong with it, that it should be hidden. And so when we use the word disability after someone's name, um, it kind of continues to perpetuate that historical context of disability should be hidden rather than standing in it proudly. 
Um, and so this is all going to come back to how that individual with a disability wants to be referred to. But this was probably one of the first times I had been introduced to this concept of a social justice approach. And some of it comes down to language. So I also want to preference that the United Kingdom has been using disability first language as the norm since the beginning of their disability rights movement, whereas we in the United States continue to use person first. Um, so now let's talk about models. There is a spectrum of different models when it comes to disability. In the United States, we take a medical model, which is an individualized approach. So if I need accommodations, I, as the person with a disability, have to come forward because I have the problem that needs to be solved. Uh, whereas a social justice approach says, no, it's a societal issue. So it's the ways in which people's activities are restricted by their environments. So for example, um, in our society and in higher education, the number one accommodation that is typically most requested is extended time. So as an individual with a disability, I would have to come forward and ask for extended time on a test or a quiz. I have the problem, I have to ask for that barrier to be removed. Whereas in a social justice model, it looks at the faculty member and says, you're creating a barrier in society by having time testing quizzes. So if you remove that barrier, the environment is no longer restricted and students don't have to ask for that accommodation uh, because it is um, universally designed at that point. And we can talk more about that as we go along. So if disability is the term we're using on uh, the environment, what should we be using for an actual condition that a person might have? And um, Evans, and colleagues, so Evans and Brodo, um, they have a book all on higher education and disability. It's phenomenal. Um, they come from higher education, these researchers, um, and faculty. And so they suggest using the word impairment, um, which means the ways in which people's bodies or minds differ from what society deems normal or typical. So instead of saying someone has a disability, we might want to say um, their impairment. And that kind of goes into kind of looking at the theoretical models I used. So this is Evans and Brodo. Um, this is a higher education model. And so what it's saying here is the interaction, if we're going to look at a problem that a student's facing when it comes to disability, um, a student's ability to function in that environment, which is known as the interaction, is based on three things. The environment, is the environment disabling or enabling? And that's on a spectrum. The person or the person's choices, are they making effective or ineffective choices? And then the actual impairment, so the condition, is it a minimal or significant impact in that environment? And so when we're trying to solve um, issues or um, anything that's coming along with an interaction and barriers we might be facing, we kind of want to look at these three main aspects. And I find this really helpful um, as a practitioner um, when working with students with disabilities? Is it the environment? Is it the student's choices? Where do we need to have a conversation to break down barriers? Um, another really important uh, conceptual model I use is the self-advocacy um, conceptual framework, which comes from special education, testing colleagues uh, 2005. Basically this model saying in order for someone to self-advocate, the individual must have knowledge of their own disability of themselves and how their disability impacts their ability uh, to learn. They must have knowledge of their rights in the laws and the legal aspect of what it means to have a disability. Um, and then a student or an individual can communicate. Um, if an individual does not have the confidence or the knowledge to uh, speak about their own disability, and if they do not have knowledge about their own rights, it can get complicated to communicate what they need in order to self-advocate. Um, and one cannot self-advocate for others and take on leadership roles unless they feel comfortable uh, communicating and they have knowledge. So it's kind of like this, um, this framework kind of builds on each other. You, you can't communicate for others unless you understand it yourself. Um, so kind of getting into my actual research, I looked at five participants from the NCAA Division I FBS schools. Um, they all came from different institutions, which is really important for me. I originally set up to look at um, just Power Five because I didn't want institutional uh, differences to affect um, when it came to like funding. Um, but it was really hard to recruit students um, and 
get people on board to allow students to have a voice. Um, and so we ended up settling with um, going with FBS schools, um, specifically looking at um, purposeful sampling. So I reached out to learning specialists. I actually found a lot of help with disability services. So those that were already um, diagnosed and those that were already receiving services. Uh, and then just networking, having the students that already came forward reach out to other students at other institutions was also helpful. I collected uh, data through 90 minute interviews done through uh, FaceTime. And then I used some data triangulation. So before I even submitted to IRB, I had tried to pilot this with other uh, students. And so that's really important to me. It's something when you're doing uh, research with students um, or just persons with disabilities, it is important that you're including them in every step of the way um, and that they have they play an active role throughout the research process. Um, and then additionally, I had submitted my findings back to every individual. All individuals had agreed or corrected me in their narratives that I had typed up. Um, and so, and like I said, it was really important that I got an individual from different institutions because that's kind of something that was lacking in the research. Um, so here are my participants. Um, all of these are pseudonyms. I tried to protect as much information as possible. Um, that was something that like confidentiality, I uphold the um, highest standard possible. So as you can see, what I'm really missing here is the sophomore and junior experience because I have a lot of first years. I'm going to have fifth year seniors. Um, and then I, um, the experience between Earl as a black male um, and the other participants who are white are very significant. And so I think there needs to be definitely more research in that area of what is um, that experience like, because it is very different um, than the other individuals who identify as white. I also think it's important to talk about the differences between ADHD and learning disabilities. And those came up throughout the research as well um, and how many, how their experiences are different. So an individual with dyslexia does have a very different experience than someone with ADHD. Um, and like I said, that came up several times throughout the research. So now kind of getting into what are some of the findings. So first is the process of self-disclosure. So in order for a student to feel comfortable to self-disclose, they're going to look at the reactions and the perceptions of others. What are the reactions of people? Um, how have people reacted in the past, especially to confidential information or um, people disclosing maybe other identities? How have those people reacted? Um, and then what are they going to, what are the perceptions of others once I disclose my disability? Are they going to think less than of me? Are they going to expect less than? Um, and so those are kind of the two major pieces students are thinking of when they're like, should I disclose to someone? Now, kind of taking that a step further, um, this was actually really interesting to me. Um, there's kind of two sub themes off of perceptions and reactions of others. One is interactions with peers. So when I had asked the participants, have you ever felt stereotyped? Um, all of them had talked about a time they felt stereotyped by a peer. Um, and I never preferenced that. I was not expecting that. Um, but all of them had talked about either feeling stigmatized or stereotyped specifically by a peer, if not their own teammates um, surrounding either having a disability, being an athlete. Um, and Earl talks about the kind of the intersectionality of being a black man who has a disability um, as an athlete and what that's like um, specifically in the classroom. Uh, but Emily talked about, she has dyslexia. She talks about how some of her teammates um, kind of tokenized her in a way. Um, and she felt as though people saw her not as getting there on her athletic, but abilities, but getting there because she had dyslexia. Um, and so that was really a unique perspective. Um, and then interaction with athletic staff is the second sub theme here. So this is where um, students had disclosed, I had two students who took medication, both of them disclosed that either coaches, um, trainers, or physical therapists have openly stated out loud in front of their teams about their medication, like either are you taking your medication or did you get your medication? 
So everyone on the team now knows they're on medication, which is a HIPAA violation. Um, but not only that, um, if students are considering um, if they want to go on medication, but we know that coaches are screaming it across the field or it's being screamed across the locker room, that might um, further stigmatize an individual from going forth and getting medication because now everyone's going to know that you're on medication for ADHD. Um, and so that was one major aspect. Another thing that one of my students said stated as they were going through this was, or one of the participants, um, it's important that uh, coaches are a little bit more open when they are recruiting, um, talking openly about disability support services. So a coach could go about this by explaining, um, you know, if something were to happen and you needed temporary accommodations due to a concussion or due to uh, being on crutches, we work collaboratively with our accessibility or disability support services. This tells the student that that coach is comfortable with having those conversations and is open um, to what it might mean to actually have a disability. And so I think that's really important when maybe we're recruiting um, to be having conversations surrounding our disability support services. Um, next is kind of looking at the advocating piece. How does one advocate for their success? And it's really being vocal and persistent. Um, which is kind of sad that students felt as though they had to persistently be vocal to get what they needed. Um, so if a student asks once and they don't get it or they feel as though they're continuously shut down, they might stop vocalizing what they need. Um, and so I think we are so fast paced uh, when it comes to academic support that sometimes we need to stop and actually listen to what is the student asking for and how can we assist in helping that student get what they need to succeed. Um, I think in, in addition to that, um, the knowledge and education piece is a sub-theme. So in order to be vocal and persistent, one must have knowledge um, and an education of what they are trying to be vocal and persistent about. Um, so actually a student needs to understand why they're asking for that extended time to feel comfortable asking for it. Um, and so if we are teaching students and helping them advocate um, and what it means for them to have um, ownership and what it means for them to be disabled um, or have a learning disability or ADHD, we can continue um, with helping them advocate. But it's, it's that missing piece of no one sitting down with students um, and having that conversation with them about what does the psychoeducational report actually mean, uh, the strengths and challenges, and what can we do to assist further. Um, and then the third sub theme here, or I'm sorry, the second sub theme here is the influence of personality and upbringing on confidence. So what this is saying is um, some of the participants stated it's just a part of my personality. It's just who I am. I was born to be vocal um, and persistent advocate, um, and that helps me be confident. Um, and then others said I, I had role models. I watched others communicate and others speak up for what they needed, either that be a mom, whether that be a coach. Um, one of the participants stated that their coach um, really ensured when they were playing as a child to speak up if they were hurt and to advocate for what they needed. And so just being around strong role models is extremely important, but also they need the opportunity to practice self-advocacy. That is extremely important. So helping students develop that skill and then continuously practice it. So um, the third theme is describing, how do students describe their academic support? What we're looking at here is um, building rapport um, and relationships help influence the actual perceptions of support. So what that means, that's wordy, if the rapport and that relationship is not there, um, a student's going to assume or feel as though that person does not support them. Um, this can be an academic advisor or counselor. This could be faculty. So a lot of students talk openly about how a faculty member could have 300 people in a lecture, why would I go uh, let them know that I need an accommodation? Um, that rapport is not there, that relationship's not there, why would I even go forth and disclose that information? Uh, why would they care? They have so many students. So I think that's really important for our end on the academic support side of things, thinking about what type of relationships are we building with these students, um, and do the students feel as though there's rapport to disclose information. Um, the sub themes here are um, athletic academic support staff and then targeted support services. So 
Athletic academic support staff, all five participants st stated that the first person they disclosed to was their academic counselor advisor. Um, and so each advisor handles that very differently from what I have gathered, but oftentimes students do feel as though they are pushed off onto a learning specialist um, after disclosing or kind of pushed off onto another person. So um, one recommendation is really some training for academic counselors and advisors on what it means to have a disability um, and helping guide that student through that conversation if that's the first contact they're gonna have uh, when they're disclosing information. Um, and then I think the second piece here is, um, <laughs> so Earl talks about his experience and how he feels as though he has a little bit of slight of an advantage um, compared to a student that is not participating in athletics, uh, just because he has everything at the touch of um, or call of the phone. If he needs someone, someone's going to be there. Um, and so I think that also talks about the you know, positive relationships that we're building in academic support with our athletes as well. Um, but it goes back to self-disclosing, thinking of the reactions and perceptions from that first team, and then that rapport um, is really necessary. And then targeted support services. So I had asked students, like, what would you want to see? Um, and many students talked about a advocate. So a student advocate who is working specifically in athletics. Um, and students had all different ideas of what this advocate would do, but really what they're looking for is someone to be proactive rather than reactive. So in higher education, this is not just an athletic or an academic support services issue, it's a higher education issue. Um, I think that we struggle often with what does, um, what does support look like and how can we be proactive rather than um, proactive rather than reactive when we're working with students. And that's what students want. They want that proactive. They want to feel welcomed. Um, so I was asked to uh, kind of look at, or what I did here was, these are word clouds. Um, and on the left are values. So I went back and I looked at the five institutions that my students came from. Um, and what I did was I pulled words that these institutions are saying we're valuing. So some of the words are serve, learn, educate, growth, inclusion, foster, uh, diversity, develop, teach, um, integrity, innovate, equity. And you look over on the right side and it's what students want more. So I went back through their transcripts and students said, we want people to be more educated. We want more support. We want more action. We want more information, more growth, more knowledge, more empathy, more openness, more mentoring more respect. So we're missing the gap somewhere between what institutions at large are saying that we value and what the, the student athlete or the college athlete um, experience is for those with learning disabilities and ADHD. Um, and so this is a very invisible population and one that does not get a lot of, um, I don't know, research, a lot of attention, or not really supporting these students. Um, and I think this is a really good time to also mention that um, if we think about it on most college campuses, there are offices and departments that support college, um, college athletes in different ways, at just students in general in different ways. Um, but where do students with disabilities go to build a sense of community? Like the sole purpose of most accessibility and disability support service centers are to ensure the institution is in compliance with ADA. So where are these students going to feel connected to other students that might be going through the same thing as them? On most college campuses, there is not a place for them to even recognize that faculty and staff might have similar um, concerns or issues. Um, and so that might make a student feel very isolated um, and alone in their college experience. <laughs> um, so I'm going to kind of go over some different things that I came up with out of the research and recommendations. Um, some of these are going to apply to what we do. Some you might be able to help advocate for on your college campus. So let's start with disability uh, support services or accessibility. So first, an accessible process. One of <laughs> this might be helpful because COVID just occurred and we had to all kind of get accessible in some way. Um, but one of the students stated that. Um, 
their process was only done on paper and you physically had to go to the center to do anything. Well, that is not accessible. Um, for some, they might need to actually access it online um, and making sure students physically come into the center and hand in a paper in order to get accommodations is not very accessible. Um, next is actually putting disability support services in accessible buildings in spaces. So one of the um, individuals had mentioned that they test in a separate center. Well, that center on their college campus is in a very dingy, lighted, noisy basement um, of a building. And I'm like, well, how is that accessible for that student to take a test uh, when it's noisy and you're supposed to be in a, you know, a minimizing distraction um, area. And if the lighting's poor, how can you focus on taking a test? Um, next is personal education. So taking the time to educate the student. Um, and I mean, that's gonna take more personnel in disability services, uh, which takes more funding as well. Um, helping the students make connections uh, with each other, um, having the actual um, accessibility or disability support service person um, that is managing the case, make an actual professional connection with the student as well. Um, creating just different spaces to create that community is really important. Um, ensuring that students have the space as though they feel as though they connect with others, whether that be faculty or staff or others in general, just students that have similar identities to them. Um, education workshops for peers, faculty and staff just across the entire higher education setting. I think there's a lack of workshops, um, just in my experience working at several different institutions. Um, having different types of um, technology, so using different uh, aspects to helping students um, kind of gain different ways to access information, uh, but also tutorials. Like some accessibility centers will just hand a student, like, here's a script pen, like, so figure it out. Here's a tutorial. Um, and some of the students talked about how they felt very lost. Like they have these technologies at their hand, but they don't know how to implement them. And so they just don't try because no one's guiding them through that process. Um, I also think maybe changing some of our names from disability support centers to accessibility um, is a little bit more of a inclusive term. Um, and it kind of leaves that stigmatization away from disability um, and it's more accessibility. How can we all access the space? Um, kind of looking at faculty members. So one thing is education and training on language. So a lot of the students in this research stated that there are several times where um, they disclose to a faculty member and they have the best intentions but they don't really know the proper language to use when having these conversations, or they can become really awkward because they're like, I wanna do what I need to do to make sure you know, you're know you getting what you need, uh, but they might not know how to go about that. So there needs to be more education and training. Um, we need to start kind of implementing universal design. And I'll talk about that briefly at the end of this presentation. But basically when we're designing curriculum, think of how can all learners um, show that they are understanding this information outside of just a test or a quiz? Or does that test or quiz really need to be timed? Like how can we remove barriers from the curriculum so students don't actually have to come forward and ask for accommodations? Um, we need to acknowledge the disabled identity more in our educational environments. Um, and then just providing a community of acceptance beyond the syllabus. So most faculty will touch on in a syllabus um, I'm open if you have, you know, if you're working with the Accessibility Resource Center or Disability Support Services, come talk to me. And that's where we just leave it. Like, there needs to be more from faculty for students to feel as though it's actually okay to come forward and ask for those accommodations. In terms of athletic staffing coaches, um, training and workshops on HIPAA and FERPA and just like Medical information privacy is obviously much needed. Um, I know that that's something that is continuous, but what does that actually mean for the student if information does get um, kind of out to other individuals? Um, more learning styles and communication workshops for coaches, I think can be really helpful. Um, hybrid goals and uh, support services. So students with disabilities are coming to academic advisors and counselors disclosing um, rather than putting them off on another resource, how can that counselor advisor help that student navigate 
through that process um, because it takes a lot to self-disclose to an individual. Um, and then also, I've been sitting here trying to think about how do we put on workshops for students? Because um, one of the students in this um, research had stated, I would come to a workshop um, if someone was talking about self-advocacy or different aspects of having a disability, but like, let's say someone on the football team did. I don't think like the head quarterback's gonna come. Um, and so how can we create an inclusive, confidential space? And I think that might come from like group counseling through psychological services, if that's available on your campus. Um, that might be an interesting partnership to provide a space for students to feel as though um, they can start building a community, um, especially in those high profile aspects. Um, in addition, I think when it comes to administration and organization, um, we need to start incorporating disabled student voice when we're creating policies and procedures. Um, do you have a specific uh, committee that meets and do you have students and is there someone who has a learning disability or just a disability in general represented on that specific committee? Um, our programs and services um, that support transitional support, help build community, more peer support for these specific individuals would be beneficial. Um, again, students wanted a college advocate um, that is going to have that proactive outreach, especially in the first six weeks, weeks which we all know is part of retention, um, rather than a reactive response where the student has to come forward. So basically students are saying, we want the college to come forward. We want someone to do the outreach to us um, because that's more welcoming than us having to come forward and say, hey, I have a disability, can you help? Um, next is to provide educational opportunities and trainings for non-disabled students. Um, and their peers and, uh, you know, other student athletes. Um, and then kind of frequently examining the college climate and marketing materials. Is everyone represented in the materials that you're producing? Um, so when it comes to kind of thinking about that, are the spaces that we're including, are the materials that we're producing, whether that be over PowerPoint, um, are they accessible for everyone? Does everyone have access to this? And I think that's really important information we should be thinking about. When it comes to NCAA and policies, we need to be providing more funding and literature on best practices beyond mental health. Although mental health is really important, it kind of ignores what it means to have a learning disability or ADHD. Um, and so I think that's a whole nother area that we haven't even tapped into. Um, we need to seek and incorporate student voice in NCAA bylaws um, and like in like we just need to allow students to have a voice um, <laughs> because these are things that are impacting them. Um, we need to reconsider medication restrictions and allow student perspective. So one of the students had stated that he felt as though um, if he doesn't take his medicine on a regular basis, um, then he doesn't like, it's viewed as he doesn't really need it. Um, and if he's overtaking it um, or if he's undertaking it, it might be seen as he's selling it. If he's overtaking it, then he's doing it for performance enhancement. And he just felt really stuck in between, like, I just need to take my medicine when I'm trying to focus on academics. Uh, but there's this pressure because of that bylaw um, that he was explaining to me that kind of um, he struggles with when he's trying to medicate. And so kind of allowing the student to kind of be the driver of their own bodies and have the right over what they need to do uh, because they're the ones living their life and they should know what they need to take when it comes to medication. Uh, and then mandating trainings and educational workshops for athletic personnel. Um, I think that's really important when it comes to understanding what it means to have a disability. Um, now, I was kind of challenged by my dissertation committee to start thinking about what can athletes do with disabilities. And I kind of pushed back because I was like, well, that's putting the ownership back on the person with the disability, which is the model we're trying to get away from, um, which is that medical model. But of course, if there are any um, athletes out there listening, um, I really think that it is important to um, seek committee participation. So ask to get involved on different uh, committees that you might be in, interested in, um, voicing concerns and providing feedback to administrators uh, or professionals. Uh, supporting and mentoring other athletes. So uh, students had stated, I'd be more likely to go get accessibility or disability resource services 
if it was coming from a student that already went through this process rather than like a 30 or 40 year old telling me to go do this. Um, and so if we enacted in some way a mentorship program for athletes to feel supported by um, others that have been through the process, they won't feel so alone. And then um, getting involved in student organizations or helping create one at your own institution can be really powerful. Um, so I had mentioned several times universal design. So this is a quick definition, but universal design uh, is basically creating different environments uh, that can be accessed and understood and used by the greatest extent po extent possible by all, um, regardless of age, size, ability, um, or disability. And so I think it's really important that when we're thinking about the way that we create spaces, produce uh, policies, procedures. We're thinking about does everyone have access to this? And it's reshaping the way that we think about our world. Um, so these are kind of seven principles of universal design. I won't go much into it because there's a whole bunch of literature and this would be a whole nother topic. But really, um, you know, we, we want to, when we're creating spaces, we want to ask is it equitable use for everyone? Um, it does the product that we're producing or the space we're producing have flexibility in use, um, low physical effort, um, can everyone access it in its size or space? So these are kind of concepts um, that should be thought about when we're thinking through universal design. So when I first started this dissertation, um, I wanted a catchy title <laughs> and it kind of came full circle, which I think is funny. Um, so I wanted to play on words. So the ball is in your court is really, you know, it's an athletic play on words. And when you think about it, um, in order to create change, we all have to take a stance to educate ourselves, um, advocate in spaces where maybe students don't have the opportunity to advocate and then act um, as in thinking through the way that we uh, create disabling environments and how do we break down those barriers. And until um, every person who does not have a disability um, takes the opportunity to educate themselves, advocate and act, I think we will continuously live in a disabling world. Um, and I think you can apply this to many different intersectionalities of identities. Like we all need to take the opportunity to educate ourselves advocate and act. And so I am going to leave you with uh, the ball is in your court. So what are you going to do today to create a social justice uh, disabling environment for your students? Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing some great information with our participants today. At this time, we do have some um, time for questions. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the Q&A. So our first question that came in was, what are some future directions for research, um, both within this area and population? Yeah, so I definitely think that, um, well, if I go back to the participant slide, you know, I, I was only able to gather information on first year students uh, and fifth year students. So I'm missing that sophomore and junior experience, which I think is still vital. Um, and then I also think, I mean, there's different directions. We can separate ADHD and learning disabilities, um, as well as what is the um, experience of uh, Black student athletes, specifically those with disabilities, um, and do they feel supported on their college campuses? Um, so I definitely think there's a lot of different directions we could take this. I think we could be looking at learning specialists and kind of building on that as well. What are their perspectives and what do they see when they're working with students? Um, but yeah, just allowing students to have more voice in research and feel comfortable. I also feel as though I should have preferenced this. Um, a lot of the students that did come forward obviously feel comfortable enough and have that level of confidence to talk about their disability and have language to describe it. So obviously they already had some level of self-advocacy where there's a whole population of students that either have never been diagnosed or don't have that ability to really feel confident to speak or self-advocate that this research is missing out on. Thanks. Um, another question that came in related to um, kind of learning specialists is how can learning specialists and athletic departments um, help students gain confidence to self-advocate? Yeah, so um, 
I, I was just working with an amazing supervisor. And so something that she would do is uh, when a psychoeducational report would come in, she would actually sit down with the student, go through each aspect with the student, um, kind of ask if they had any questions. Um, obviously the evaluator should be going through those with the student, but sometimes it takes a little bit longer to process, um, helping that student kind of understand maybe where their challenges are and what type of strategies can we help that student implement, um, but also kind of practicing what might it look like to talk to a faculty member about this or if the student needs accommodations, or um, let's say that comes back in and says, you know, the student, as a recommendation, a student should be medicated. Well, having that conversation potentially, um, if that's not done through, um, you know, sports psychology at your institution, have a conversation with the student about um, what does that look like and what are the student's options? Because that can be, uh, I think, a scary place to be navigating, especially if a disability is being diagnosed in uh, at the collegiate level and it's not prior coming in from a high school or early childhood. Our next two um, questions relate in terms of like staffing. So how can advisors learn more about person first language um, to even talk with recruits, families, especially at institutions that do not have a learning specialist? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so for myself, like this was the first time I was really coming into this. Like I said, coming from special education, I was always taught uh, person first language. Um, and so that book from, um, I have a slide next that cites everything. And I, I'm sure you can get that from um, my PowerPoint. Like, out. But I think that that book really goes, it dives in deep into different ways in which, um, you know, we can think about it, but really just asking a student how they prefer, if they feel comfortable enough to disclose, I think is really important. Um, it's, it's really going to depend on the student. There's also some great like YouTube videos I found when I'm presenting um, to classes on this um, that have been really helpful that I could send out. Um, but just taking the time to educate yourself and get comfortable with using both languages. Throughout my dissertation, I opted to use both so I wasn't excluding anyone. Um, but when it comes down to it, it really does come to asking um, the student. And that's going to be the best way that you feel comfortable um, and making that student feel comfortable. Um, but I think more so it comes down to also um, listening in, like uh, using listening skills of how the students referring to themselves when they're talking about their disability. Um, are, they state, are they stating when they're disclosing, um, you know, I have dyslexia, or are they saying I am a person with dyslexia? Like, how are they communicating that to you when they're disclosing? So really listening skills, I think, are important there. Our next question is, um, I'll par paraphrase, but I've gotten pushback on the community piece between students due to FERPA and HIPAA. Is it thought that students don't want to be known or connected around their disability? Um, does your data show that students would, you know, want to have a group that's specific to their disability? Um, so when I was asking students specifically about like groups, um, so most of them aren't revenue producing. So a lot of them are more Olympic sports and they were very comfortable. Um, and most of them were like, yes, I would show up. To a group, um, but someone had kind of flagged like, but if our head quarterback has a disability, I don't think he's showing up because that would be on the news the next day. Um, and so I think we can hit a specific um, group of students that might not feel as though um, it's uh, as stigmatizing to come forward, but I think there might be, there might need to be another approach to helping other students come forward um, and find that, um, comfortability. And I think that might start with that mentoring program where if there are other students, uh, so like I use technology with my students uh, and something my supervisor at my old institution, and I would go back and forth on is, well, why don't we have a student that's using that technology show other students that are incoming how to use that technology because they'll feel more comfortable doing it. I think the same could be true for um, having sophomores and juniors that might have had to go through the process of asking for services um, kind of mentor other students that are coming forth as in a freshman or first year class. Um, I think that could be really beneficial because they don't feel as though they're in it alone. I had a student who um, came forward to participate um, and I know that from the data that I had received, their 
they had 13 athletes that had registered. And she said, I thought I was the only one. Like, I thought I was the only one at this entire institution in student athletics that had a disability and had to go through this. Um, and so she was like, if I knew that someone else had to go through this and I could have been mentored, that would have been helpful. Um, and so I think leaning on mentorship from other student athletes uh, could be really beneficial. And then we have another scenario question. Um, I see students who are not diagnosed with a disability, but have had less than optimal preparation for college level work, who then sometimes fall between the cracks. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to advocate for those students that don't necessarily qualify for services? Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, well, so the I actually had a participant who was not, um, who'd never, received funding to actually get tested um, because the social justice model believes in breaking down barriers um, to a disabling world rather than stating you have the disability, you need to fix it. Um, and so I think it's kind of pushing back on the environment, like kind of going back to what choices are the student making, um, kind of where is that student's challenges uh, when it comes to the environment and the interaction. Um, and then, you know, are there things that you can do as the professional um, in this circumstance to kind of help others see it from a different lens and make maybe things a little bit more accessible? And I know that's really large because uh, that's a big task to do. That's, um, that's asking a lot on one person, but I think I think it starts with small things um, and each person on this call really thinking about how can how can we create spaces um, that are more inclusive. Um, but when it comes to those that are not diagnosed, um, I think that can be really difficult because they're not receiving the same uh, maybe accommodations that someone that is diagnosed might have. Um, and that's going to come down to trying to challenge people to break down barriers so that everyone has access to it, whether you have paperwork or not. So that was our last question. Um, Stephanie, do you have any final comments before we close today's presentation? No, thank you so much for everyone that attended. Um, I really appreciate you just listening. Um, and I just enjoyed having the opportunity to share my dissertation research. And if anyone needs to reach out, my email is down below. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. On behalf of N4A and its leadership, thank you for taking time out of your day to attend um, today's presentation. That concludes. Um, good luck or good luck with your school year.